Our sermon passage today is Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to come to you right now, and we ask, Lord, that you would... Make your presence known to us today, Lord, that we would see you and that we would know you in such a way that we would be changed by you. Lord, we're so thankful. We're so thankful for the fact that when we rebelled against you and when we went off in our sin, Lord, that you didn't abandon us, but Lord, you developed a plan that you sent your son not only as a means of making reconciliation, but as a means of redeeming us and forgiving us and making us new, Lord. And I just pray that as we sit down and we study your word today and we encounter your word today, Lord, that your spirit would continue to do just that, that you would open our eyes, you would open our ears, let us see what is true, let us know you and meet you, and in so doing, Lord, be transformed by you. Lord, we love you and praise you. Amen. Guys, please have a seat. My name is LJ. I'm the pastor of Youth and Missions here at Redeemer Church. Um, If you're visiting with us today, uh, it is our practice to preach through a book of the Bible. And uh, if you're here today, you're actually coming in in uh, the middle of, well, not really the middle, but the beginning portions of our time through the book of Matthew. Uh, If you look up on the screen, you'll see that we've entitled our sermon series through the book of Matthew, Good News. Uh, We're a relatively simple people. Uh, We read the book of Matthew and thought, this is pretty good news. So we decided to name our series Good News. Uh, In a very similar fashion, today's passage uh, is a passage in which Jesus is declaring his disciples as salt and light to the world. So today's sermon passage is essentially... Uh, titled Salt and Light. Uh, That's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, We try to keep things as relatively simple as we possibly can because we genuinely believe uh, that the scripture is not intended to be complex. We serve a God that we believe wants to be known, that wants to be understood. So he's given us his word as a revelation of himself so that we could know him. And today's passage is a short passage and it's a relatively simple passage passage. So we're going to study that in the hopes that through this passage that we would have a better understanding of who God was. And that in a passage that is as simple and straightforward as this passage on salt and light, that we would have the time to just kind of meditate and and reflect on what God has called his followers to be in this world. Now we do want to be careful not to make the mistake of thinking that because something is simple that it has no depth. There's a lot of depth in this passage, and hopefully as we go through this, um, you'll be reminded of of many things that you've already learned, and then hopefully you might even learn a couple of new things that will help you understand it. Um, But before we go into this, let's make sure that we're placing it in the right context. All right, so right now, uh, this passage on salt and light is falling within what we call the Sermon on the Mount. All right, the Sermon on the Mount started, uh, we started our study of the Sermon on the Mount last week while Jamie introduced the Beatitudes or the Blessed Statements, all right? But it's very important that we understand the Sermon on the Mount is a teaching that Jesus is giving his disciples, and it is a teaching on how to live as a citizen of the kingdom while you're here on earth. So a lot of the Sermon on the Mount is going to deal specifically on how you interact with and relate to God and how you interact with and relate to your neighbors. 
But before we get into those things, it's very important that we start with an understanding of the gospel. And Jamie did a great job of this last week of reminding ourselves, hey, when we study the Sermon on the Mount, specifically the Beatitudes, this is not a checklist of if you do these things, then you enter into the kingdom. We need to remind ourselves that the gospel of Matthew starts with the announcement of a king and then moves on to the reminder of, hey, if you want to be a part of this kingdom, if you want to follow this king, that the way that you enter into the kingdom is by repentance through faith. So we repent of our former ways and we enter into the kingdom in faith. We follow the king. All right, so it's so important that before we, uh, we try to delve into how do we live, as believers, it's so important that we get the gospel right first. And the gospel is a gift, it's good news, and that is simply this, that for a world that is in darkness, that is experiencing the corruption of sin, that each one of us individually have experienced what sin does to us in destroying us and harming us, but also breaking our relationship with the Lord, that when we need to be freed, when we need to be forgiven, when we need to become a part of a greater kingdom, the way that we do that is by grace through faith. We trust the king. We trust the Messiah that's come, and we receive the gift that he's giving us in the kingdom. So when we get into the Sermon on the Mount, the question is not, do do you do these things in order to get into the kingdom? No, he's speaking to people that he already assumes are citizens of the kingdom. The only way in is through the gospel. The only way in is through the good news of Jesus Christ. But he's saying, hey, now that you are citizens, this is how you live. So last week when we did the Beatitudes, Jamie went through and kind of broke it down and he's saying, hey, now that you are following in faith, this is the value system of the kingdom. So he's saying, hey, this is the blessed life. This is how you live a blessed life. And now that we're moving to this next passage, he's saying, hey, now that you are a part of the kingdom that you've entered through faith in Jesus Christ, this is the ethic, this is the value system. But now that you understand the ethic and the value system, I'm now giving you a very specific role. You are salt and you are light. And this brings us to our very first point in this sermon is this, a very consistent theme throughout scripture is that when God forms a people, he blesses them so that they can be a blessing. Then the disciples here, when Jesus is talking to them, he's gone through the virtue. He's saying, hey, these are the values of the kingdom. And if you live according to the values of the kingdom, this is the blessed life. This is how you receive blessing and experience the happiness that comes with living in the kingdom. But if you've experienced that blessing, that blessing is not a treasure for you to hoard, but that blessing is given to you so that you can then go out and become a blessing to others. He turns to them and saying, hey, this is the blessed life, and now this is the role that you've been given, and it is no small role. You are salt of the earth. You are light of the world. This is huge. This is huge to think, hey, the way that this kingdom is going to be made manifest to the world around us is by his disciples going out and representing him as salt and light. All right, so what does it mean to be salt and light? All right, this is where I get to play a a little bit with grammar and interpretation. Uh, This is a lot of fun. We've been given a metaphor, all right? And and a metaphor is essentially a, a, a picture with words that God has given us to help us understand a greater teaching, right? It's a word painting. And metaphors are amazing because when you get a metaphor, it challenges us to use our imaginations, And to really think through, oh man, what does it mean to be salt and light? Metaphors are really fun because they're sticky. Like a good metaphor will get in your brain and it'll just stay there. By the end of this sermon, you could probably have this passage memorized and, and just have this image of what it means to be salt and light built into your brain. It'll just reside with you. And that's the power of a metaphor. But when we, ad- when we address a metaphor in Scripture, we have to be really careful Right? We have to be really careful not to overread or overinterpret the metaphor. 
So Jesus gave us the metaphor, you are salt and you are light. Well, he gave it to his disciples, all right? And when he gives them to this, he's saying, hey, there is an illustration of a teaching that I'm giving you, a broader teaching, and it's really important that you understand this broader teaching. So here is a small metaphor that kind of will open your eyes to what the broader teaching is. So when we interpret a metaphor, we always want to interpret the metaphor by the surrounding context. All right, here's the warning. If all we do is take the metaphor and try to decide the meaning of the metaphor based on what the metaphor says, we can run into some big mistakes. And here's what I mean by this. When Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, he is not saying that all things that are true of salt are now true of you. When he says you are the light of the world, he's not saying that all things that are true of light are now true of you. If that were the case, then salt of the earth would have some really easy benefits, like salt is really good for preserving things, for slowing down decay. Salt is really good for enhancing seasoning. Um, Salt is also really good at destroying fields. It was used in wars. When you would conquer a city, you would salt the earth so that nothing would grow again. Salt was fantastic at spreading hypertension and raising your blood pressure. I don't think that what Jesus is saying is, hey, you are the salt of the earth. Go off and destroy fields and raise people's blood pressure. No, we want to understand the metaphor in the context of what's going on. And the context in this setting is we're coming off of the Beatitudes. Guys, this is what the blessed life looks like. Hey, if you live out these virtues, I'm now sending you into the world in the same way that you have been blessed by the kingdom. You are now going to take those ways and you're going to be a blessing to those that you encounter. The same thing with light. Your eyes have been open. You've seen things. You were in darkness, but you're not there. The light in this passage is actually a little bit easier to interpret because they actually tell us in the passage how to understand the light. You're the light of the world. A city on the hill cannot be hidden. So light is revealing. Whatever it means to be light is to say, hey, we're supposed to be revealing things that otherwise would not have been seen. You're supposed to be out there, not hidden. Said, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. So light is supposed to be illuminating. It's a bit redundant, but you get the point. Light is supposed to give light. All right, if we're the light of the world, whatever it means for us to be light means we're supposed to be in the darkness, giving light to people that otherwise wouldn't see what was there. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Light is supposed to be guiding and directing. Whatever it means to be light, he's saying, hey, when your light is shining, the goal is for your light to shine in such a way that people will see what you're doing. And in seeing what you're doing, they'll recognize the Father in heaven and they'll give glory to him. Our light, whatever it means to be salt and light, we're understanding in this passage that it's intended to be a blessing. Now, the salt, it doesn't exactly tell us how salt is a blessing. It actually gives us a warning. You're the salt of the earth, right? But then it goes on to say, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall it, its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. It doesn't really tell us how salt is a blessing. But it, what it does tell us is whatever it means to be salt, it's supposed to be a good thing for the people that encounter salt. And then there's a warning of like, hey, you are the salt of the earth, but be careful not to lose your saltiness. Because if you lose your saltiness, you're not, you're not good for what you've been called to anymore. And we're going to deal with that passage in just a second, but understanding what it means to be salt forces us to kind of dig into the larger passages. There's a couple of places that I think is really, really helpful. One, um, historically, like I said earlier, salt was used as a preservative and as, as a seasoning, right? So the preservative, I think, is really interesting. It's applied to something in order to slow decay, slow to corruption. And you think about the Beatitudes and the way the Beatitudes call to live our life. The Beatitudes are saying, hey, we, blessed is he that's a peacemaker. Man, that, that seems like an amazing way to slow decay and slow corruption. If you can go into this world and act as a person that's seeking reconciliation and seeking to establish peace rather than sowing discord and sowing disunity, that is like being salt to the world. 
Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Guys, these are all things that if we were to live out our lives this way, that the people around us would be benefited They would benefit greatly simply from us living out the virtues of the kingdom among them. It's such a huge thing. We're meant to go into a world that is corrupt and broken, and we're meant to go live in such a way that they might be preserved until they can hear the full news of the healer that's coming. It's massive. It's it's such a good message. Another way that salt is used, I, I love this, is as a seasoning. Well, how in the world do we live as a seasoning? How do we enhance flavor, right? Well, in uh, Hebrew tradition and rabbinic tradition, salt is oftentimes used um, as a metaphor for wisdom. So the wisdom of the Lord would be described as like a salt that's seasoned over things. This is really, really interesting to me because in the Greek language where it says there, uh, if salt has lost its taste, the actual translation is if salt becomes foolish, right? If the salt becomes a fool. Well, how does that become lost its taste? Well, the idea is is there is a wise way to use salt, and that is to benefit from its saltiness, but there is a way in which salt can become corrupt, can become defiled, and when it becomes corrupt and defiled, it's kind of lost its taste. It's not acting in the wise way, it's acting in the foolish way, right? The salt has become foolish, and, and this is a, a huge thing for us to remember. It's like, hey, how do we live our lives in such a way that we'd be salt? Well, we live wisely. We live the way that the, the king has established for us so that in living wisely, we might be kind of like a seasoning of wisdom in people's life. Paul uses the same illustration when he, I think he's talking to the Colossians, and he says, hey, speak to one another and let your language be as if it were seasoned with salt. He's saying, hey, when you speak to one another, you ought to speak to one another according to the values and the virtues established within the kingdom ethic. Now, and this is huge. This is so huge because he's now giving his disciples a role. And he's saying, hey, guys, this is what your role is to go into the world and to be salt and to be light. And here's another thing that I want to emphasize on this. Is that us being salt and light is intended to give a glimpse and a foretaste of what the kingdom could be like for people that have never experienced anything like that before. It's so huge to think that we then get to become representatives of the kingdom and the way that we live our life among the rest of the world gives them a taste of what the kingdom could be like. And here's the thing. This is the other mistake that we make is this idea of if you're a disciple, then you're salt and light. Well, let's be really careful with the metaphor. Just because you are a disciple doesn't mean that your mere presence in the room is a presence of salt and light to those around you. When I was in high school, I remember uh, our youth minister challenged us, man, take your Bibles to school. And I was like, all right, we're going to do that. Take the Bibles to school and let people know at school that that you're a Christian. I was like, all right. So I put my Bible in my backpack where nobody could see it. (laughs) And I just prayed that in my obedience of taking my Bible to school, that just the presence of my Bible in the backpack was somehow going to ooze out to those around me and was going to be some sort of blessing to them, right? Well, here's the thing, is that the Bible is only a blessing to those that are actually going to hear a word from the Bible, In the same way, if we're going to be living among a lost world, we are only salt and light in as much as we're willing to live out the commandments, live out the lifestyle of the kingdom. Our simple presence in the room does nothing. The only benefit is if we're actually making ourselves known, making ourselves aware, living out the ethic that's been given out, and then taking that opportunity to point to the greater king. Rosaria Butterfield, in in her book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, talks about using hospitality as a means of of, of being able to share her faith. And she says, you know, whenever I think about living among the lost world, my goal is this, is I want to go from where the point where strangers become friends and friends become family. I want to be in the world so that my presence in the world will allow relationships 
to, to be able to transition to where strangers who know nothing of me and know nothing of the kingdom will know me and be able to become my friend. And then hopefully in knowing me, they would get a glimpse of the kingdom and would then want to know the Father. And in knowing the Father, they would become my family. That's what it's like to be salt and light to the world. We're blessed to be a blessing. Church, if you have heard the gospel and believe the gospel, you have a role in the kingdom, and it is no small role. The next point we want to get to is this, is that another consistent teaching is that we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. All right, again, this is a, a teaching that's all throughout Scripture, is that when God calls his people and they follow him in faith. He establishes the people so that those people can then be a blessing. But there's a very important thing. In order for us to be a blessing to the world, we actually have to be in the world. We have to engage the world directly. We are called to be salt of the earth. We are not useful if we're not of the earth. We're called to be light of the world. We're not useful light if we're not actually in the world and engaging the world. Our temptation when we, are, when we receive salvation, when we receive forgiveness, our temptation when we experience the blessings from the Lord and the joy that comes from being made a child of God and, and being, being given citizenship in the kingdom, our temptation is then to want to isolate ourselves and insulate ourselves and to act in such a way so as to protect the treasure that has been given to us. Historically, this has always been the case. You've got people that would form these monasteries in which they would go off far off into the wilderness and they would separate themselves so as to not be defiled. Because the thought was that if I take this gift and then I go and I live along, uh, among the world, then maybe my treasure, maybe my salvation would be at risk. And guys, we do the same thing today. We experience the joy of our salvation and we think, well, I gotta get myself away from the rest of the world. I need to only be around believers. I need to only be doing Christian things. I need to only be hanging out with this type of people. I need to separate myself from the rest of the world. And guys, when we insulate ourselves from the world, we do two things that are extremely dangerous. And I'm gonna go through these and I want you to hear me on this. Number one, we convince ourselves of an incredible, incredibly dangerous untruth about the gospel. And that is that we convince ourselves that the gift of salvation that he's given to us is fragile and that the God that gives us that salvation is weak and incapable of sustaining it in our lives. When we are so convinced that if I engaged in the lost world, then my salvation is at risk. If I go back out among the the unbelievers, then my salvation is at risk. Then we've convinced ourselves that the gift that's been given to us can only be protected if we completely insulate ourselves. And that's not true. That is not true. The gift that we've been given, we've been given in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the the power of the Holy Spirit seals that gift within us. He is our guarantee of an inheritance. And later in the gospel, actually not Matthew, but in John, Jesus is going to make it clear, hey, those that I've given to the Father, he holds in their hand. And if anybody is in the Father's hand, nobody can pluck them out of his hand. Guys, our salvation, when we trust in the Lord and we follow him in faith, our salvation is secure and it's secured not on our ability to maintain this perfect, separated, holy lifestyle, but it's secured based on the power of the one who gives us his holiness and gives us his righteousness, and he maintains the work that he started within us. And in fact, he even promises that I will complete the good work that I've begun in you. And why does he do this? Why is it so important that we understand that our holding of this gift is dependent on his power? It's so that we can trust him to maintain it when we go back out into the world. We're called to live in the world. And living in the world does not jeopardize the gift of salvation that we've been given. In fact, living in the world gives us the opportunity to experience how strong God is, how powerful God is. Here's the tension. We're called to live in the world, but not of the world. 
This is the mistake that may have been made all throughout history. Israel was gathered together as a people intended to be a holy nation, proclaiming the goodness of God and a blessing to all the nations around it. See, they were called to be separate from the world, but they were not called to be separated from the world. And Israel went out there, and rather than living out their faithfulness as a witness to God's goodness to all the nations around them, they got out there and said, hey, the way that I want to live among the world or the way that I want to live among the nations is by becoming a exactly like the nations. So that's the other side of the warning. Guys, we're called to live in the world, but we are called to live separate from the world. We're called to live a distinct life from the world. And we're actually warned to be very careful not to be corrupted by it. Here it says this, the salt, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its saltiness or has lost its taste, it cannot be restored. Now, let's be careful not to push the metaphor too far. Sodium chloride does not ever cease to become sodium or be sodium chloride. The meaning of this is not the idea that salt can then become not salt, but the meaning is, is that salt could become defiled or corrupted in such a way in which it's not actually benefit for the use of salt anymore. In Corinthians, Paul experiences this with, with the church where he goes back and he's taught them the gospel and he's taught them these things. And what he finds when he returns back to the church is that the church has actually done the exact opposite of what he taught. He taught them to live a separate life but to engage the world. But what they did instead was they closed themselves out from the world and then they became exactly like the world that was outside of them. He comes back and he says, man, I found among you a sexual immorality that doesn't even exist among the Gentiles. This should not be. You should be distinct from the world. You should not be like the world. And it wasn't as if somebody had sinned and then they went and, and asked for forgiveness. It was that they were celebrating the sin that this in person was living in. This wasn't an instance where a person had sinned and they'd made a mistake and they'd sought sought the Lord in repentance and, and sought out forgiveness, it was that the church was saying, hey, the fact that you're living out this sexual immoral, immoral lifestyle seems to be a sign of grace. You're accepted no matter what. And Paul is saying, no, this is not the way that we live as a church. We have a distinct virtue, a value system that we live by, and those of us that are believers cannot allow ourselves to be, be corrupted by the sins that once destroyed us. Then the second thing that the church in Corinth was doing is that they were isolating themselves from the outside world. And Paul goes back and he's saying, hey guys, I told you not to hang out with people that were liars and deceivers and sexually immoral, but clearly the message got lost. I meant do not hang out with Christians who claim to be Christians, but then willingly live out these lifestyles. I did not mean to separate yourself from people like this in the world. If I had meant this, you would have had to have let leave the world. So he's kind of building in this tension. He said, guys, I'm calling you to be salt and light. And that means that you have to engage the world. You cannot insulate yourself from the world, but you have to engage the world without being corrupted by the world. And, and honestly, well, how do we do that? Well, the way that we do that is we, we do that by continuously turning to the king who is capable of sustaining us and renewing us. Repentance, Jamie said this a few sermons ago, repentance is not just the way that you get into the kingdom, but repentance becomes the way that we live out our life as believers. How do we maintain our saltiness? Well, we maintain our saltiness by actually living out and following Christ and allowing him to transform us. When we make a mistake, we go to confess. We seek renewal. But we're careful not to let our saltiness become unsalty. Paul actually says it this way. He said, I want to run my, my race in such a way that I discipline my body so that I may not be disqualified. So that when I preach to you, I'm not disqualified in the things that I'm saying. A lot of people read this passage of being cast out into the road and being good for nothing but to be trampled under the feet. They read this as if they're afraid that I might lose my salvation. I don't really think that he's actually talking about 
the risk of eternal judgment or the risk of losing your salvation. I genuinely believe when you're in the kingdom that you're sealed with the spirit and you do not risk losing your position as citizen. But what I do want you to understand is that you've been given a role and it is no small role. And if you allow yourself to be compromised with, with, by the world, there's a chance that you could lose your effectiveness in that role. I don't think you can lose your salvation, but you sure can lose your witness. So we want to be careful not to do that. And then the third and final point that I want you to get to this is that how we live our life is supposed to bring all glory to the Father. So he says this very simply, let your light shine in such a way so that when people see your good works, that they glorify your Father who is in heaven. When we get into the text, the Sermon of the Mount is going to be a temptation in all of these regards. There are two big warnings that I want to give you here, and that is, one, don't allow the Sermon on the Mount, even though it's teaching you how to live within the kingdom, don't allow that to tempt you into this idea of works-based salvation. The Sermon on the Mount is not giving you a list of duties that you have to complete in order to enter the kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount is giving us a way in which we live since we belong to the kingdom. But then the other temptation would be, as we're living out the teachings that we're given in the certain Sermon on the Mount, is for us to begin, be tempted into this, uh, this realm of self-righteousness. As if in following what the Lord has given us, we end up elevating ourselves rather than elevating our king. And it's so important that we realize that, guys, if we are salt and we are light, we are only useful, we're only a blessing as salt and light in as much as we're pointing back to the Savior, right? Now, here's the thing. You might be salt and light to people in your community, and there's a possibility that they may never come to faith. They may never trust Christ. And here's the beauty of this is that even if they never accept Christ, they're still going to benefit from the king, kingdom simply because of your faithfulness and, and your, your, your presence within their life. If you're living faithfully around them, then they're going to benefit from the kingdom in such a way that they get blessings through you. But here's the thing is that if we live as salt and light, but then we never actually lead them to the way in which they can have a saving knowledge of Christ, we've not blessed anyone. We've not been a benefit to anyone. So our lifestyle always has to lead to a message, and that message is always going to be the message of the gospel of the king. Well, how do I know that? Well, right now he's commissioning his disciples as salt and light, but at the end of Matthew, he's going to give them what's called the great commission in which he says, hey, go into all of the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. See, the idea of being salt and light is like I might be able to give you a foretaste, I might be able to give you a glimpse into the kingdom, but at the end of the day, if I don't introduce you to the king, I've not actually been a blessing to you. I want to live among you in such a way that you also can glorify the Lord. I like food analogies. Food sticks with us, right? I mean, every time I preach, I have a food analogy, and here's another one that's coming. <laughs> Jesus liked food analogies, so I'm in good company. Um, my grandmother made the best biscuits in the world. There's just the best biscuits in the world. I don't know what love would taste like as an ingredient, but whatever it is, it was in my grandmother's biscuits, right? When I tasted that biscuit, I mean, I, I just tasted what a biscuit is. I don't know what it is, but that's what a biscuit is. And since then, I've had a lot of really good biscuits. You know, I'll go to all these restaurants, and I'll have these biscuits, and I'll be like, man, that is a good biscuit. But at the end of the day, I find myself saying, man, no matter how good this biscuit is, it's just kind of a shadow of a greater biscuit. Like, it's not grandma's biscuit. Right? If you guys are into philosophy, this is kind of a southerner's version of uh, Plato's chair. <laughs> right? <laughs> there is a one true biscuit, and my grandmother made it. <laughs> guys, here's the point that I'm trying to get across is just simply this Our king is good. He's so loving and he's so kind. He's the great comforter, the great physician. He's so merciful in the way that he handles our sin. He's so amazing in the way that he offers forgiveness and restoration. And guys, we're called to live our lives in such a way that we represent that king in our community. 
But our representation can only be a shadow of the greatness that is the actual kingdom and the king. So this is my challenge, church. If you have believed the gospel and you have entered into that kingdom, I want you to know that you've been given a role and it is no small role. Guys, I want you to live your lives in the world so that you can be a blessing and not be compromised. And the reason I want you to do that is because if you can live your life the way that Christ has instructed us to live our lives, that the people around us can get a foretaste of what the kingdom can be like. And if they can get a foretaste, that will open up the avenue, open up the road for us to introduce them to the king.